Welcome to Vision 2222, the podcast where we explore the scientific, technical, social, and human changes that we might see if we were able to travel two centuries into the future. We interview leaders in science and technology and experts in business and the humanities to take a look at the possibilities of the future. Our guest this episode is Tom Lytle. Tom is a practitioner, mentor, and teacher in Lean Six Sigma, which is a methodology for efficiency and productivity, not only in industrial pursuits such as oil and gas and manufacturing, but also in all kinds of human endeavors. Vision 2222 is the brainchild of Mikhail Gladkik, and his co-hosts, Amanda Chady and myself, John Marsh. I'm a university administrator in a material science department, and so I get a ringside seat into some of the great things that are coming our way, the materials that will enable us to travel into the future. Hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm Amanda Chady, a consultant and mentor to early stage startups in biological and life sciences. I specialize in business development and funding strategies to support these startups in order to move the discoveries from the lab into a commercial successes. My name is Mikhail Gladkik. Uh, I'm a technologist. I'm specializing in uh, 3D printing, digital supply chain, industry 4.0, and related technologies around this topic. And I'm also writing science fiction when I have time. So Tom, welcome to podcast Vision 2222. Uh, really, really happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, John. And thank you, Amanda. I appreciate the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to what might come to pass for all of us as we go forward. And I've known Tom for a long time. And um, I really wanted to do a conversation like this um, also for, for, for a few years now. And I'm really excited that we can do it. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll try. I'll try to live up to the billing. As Mikhail and I, Mikhail mentioned, he and I worked worked together a long time ago. We've done some entrepreneurial things together at various points in our friendship. And currently, I'm a founder and a co-founder and managing partner of a technology implementation firm called Rana Analytics. And so we we are a the firm focused around finance 2.0, digital transformation of, the, of the, the corporate finance function and implementing enterprise software. My background is, as Mikhail mentioned, uh, fairly varied. I uh, spent expensive, extensive time in manufacturing in a variety of industries, doing continuous improvement and quality work, uh, worked, in, worked in and run technology and supply chain functions for manufacturing and, and ESG companies. And as well as worked in corporate fit and worked in, in the banking and financial services industries at, at earlier points in my career, spent time in HR, spent time in operations, spent time in manufacturing, uh, spent time in IT and supply chain. So but a pretty good view of overall corporate, what, how, how companies function at various sizes. And in my current, my current job gives me a lot of opportunity to, to look at progressive companies who are looking to make transformative changes in their, in their operating environments. So um, hopefully can can add a little bit of color and context as we go forward in this conversation this morning. Thank you, Tom. I'm uh, really excited to have you here with us on the podcast. So the, the first question I have, Tom, uh, you've done so many different things uh, throughout your career. Um, but as far as I know, you are the evangelist of Lean Six Sigma methodology. Can you tell us more about it? Does it mean to do more with less? and just some magical way to improve margins in businesses? That's a great question. And it, and I get that a lot because I also, I teach Lean Six Sigma, as you know, at a couple of different colleges, Mikhail, in the in the Houston area. And, I, and that question comes up invariably in whatever academic setting I'm in. And I think what it really comes down to for me, no, number one, no, it's not magic. Number two, it's, it's more about a way, about a, providing a, a structured framework for, problem solving than it is anything else. And I think it's and it's as much a an approach and a way of looking at business problems as it is a, a methodology, quote unquote, to solve problems. And so I am an evangelist for it, but I'm an evangelist for it in the sense that you know, bring the right tool to the job. Don't walk around with a hammer and turn every problem into a nail. Um, I'm a big advocate of being of being nimble, being flexible, and being adaptable to the to the problem in front of you, and then bringing the tool out of the, the Lean Six Sigma toolkit appropriate to that problem. And I think that's where a lot of folks, in my opinion, 
get tripped up is they get very rigid and dogmatic around applying the methodology in a, in a very prescriptive way. And I tend to, I tend to be an advocate for right sizing the solution to the, to the scale of the problem you're trying to solve. Oh, thank you, Tom, uh, for the explanation. Uh, and today we're facing, as, as a humanity, many different problems, right? And we, but this is Vision 2022. We're trying to imagine what will happen in 200 years, so long time, long interval. Um, so the questions I have are more, maybe more philosophical. I, for example, we're dealing with a climate change crisis right now. So can uh, Lean Six Sigma somehow provide us solutions to address that? I think it can, and I think it can do it in the sense of accelerating emerging technologies. One of the things that you, you, you and I have some experience with, Mikhail, is, is the concept of a lean startup. And I think that's where you could apply some of those lean and Six Sigma approaches to accelerating the development of new technologies and bring them down the commercialization path much more rapidly and get to a viable product that you can then bring to market more quickly. In addition to that, I think there's also opportunities on, on existing technologies to frankly apply those tools and make them cleaner. Um, you know, you and I both know from our oil and gas experience that there's there's a great opportunity to reduce emissions in particularly in supply chain and hauling sand around in, in uh, onshore drilling fields. The, the fewer trips you have to make, the less emissions you're, you're, you're producing and putting into the environment. So if you can optimize those networks using Lean and Six Sigma tools to reduce the number of trips you have to make, you're reducing emissions. You can apply the same tools in the manufacturing process to make, make equipment that fails less often, produce equipment that has a longer life. So I, I absolutely think there's there's ap there's applicability for Lean and Six Sigma. Once again, right sized and 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 done in the right context. But I'm very very passionate about it about that as a, and, and advocating for that as a methodology or as a toolkit to help in those areas. So in, in in the same vein, you think Lean Six Sigma can take us to the stars and beyond? Uh, by itself, probably not. Can it be a an accelerant to that? I think absolutely. Once again, you, you're you're going to end up you're going to start with a funnel of a bunch of different potential ways to get there, and you, using some of the lean startup and some of the lean six sigma approaches, you can you can winnow that down, I think, much more rapidly to the most viable options to get us there in a, a more efficient and a, frankly a faster on a faster timeline. No, thank you. That that makes a lot of sense for our listeners. Can you just define what is lean six sigma and you know how it can be applied for our listeners that don't know about it. And, and maybe also, uh, you mentioned Lean Startup. Uh, what is the difference? What is Lean Startup? How it can help um, with innovation, specifically in the business area? Sure. So, so Amanda, I'll take your question first and then segue into a, an answer on the Lean Startup. So Lean Six Sigma is, is a continuous improvement or process improvement framework born in Japan in the Toyota manufacturing facilities. Um, in the middle of the early middle of, of the 20th century and has evolved over time to be a, a variety of things to a variety of people. But in short, it's it focuses on re removing waste and reducing variability, vari process variation in, in business processes. Um, but with, it's got applicability in the back office as well as on the in the operations and manufacturing spaces. Most people traditionally think of Lean Six Sigma as a manufacturing or operations production methodology or framework for making improvements in your business. So, Mikhail, to address your question about the Lean Startup, um, Lean Startup, it, it's a title of a book that came out about 10, 15 years ago. And effectively, what it, the intent of the book or the, or the driving kind of point of the book is fail fast so you can succeed quickly. And basically, it's using lean, a lean approach to arrive at a minimum viable product as quickly as you can by by rapid iteration. It's not agile in the in the agile software development development uh, sense. It's more let's figure out all the ways to not do this as quickly as we can so we can land on the way to do it in the fewest number of uh, of iterations or the or the and the least amount of time. That does sound like magic. <laughs> <laughs> With the recipe. Yeah well look in in, in the right setting it I mean, you know this as well as I do, Mikhail, from our experiences together. Um, you can rip a lot of inefficiency and a lot of waste out of organizations in, in very short order with vigorous application of this stuff and a lot of and, and good buy-in. You know, I know at one point, one stop in my career, we took up $125 million in cost out over 18 months. And that's just what we reported to Wall Street. So now that's a, in an organization with a $1.4, $1.5 billion market cap. 
So you can, it can be magic. Um, it can also fail spectacularly. So uh, switching gears a little bit, you spent a chunk of your career involved in improving quality or managing quality. What does it even mean when we talk about quality in the business or manufacturing setting? I, so it, there's a couple of different definitions, and it really depends on who you ask. If you ask someone with a, a formal, uh, very rigid quality background who's a API certified auditor, you, you will likely get a different answer. My answer is, and I'm always going to bias back to the business outcome, my answer from a quality standpoint is how do we best address our customers' requirements in the in the shortest amount of time for the least amount of cost and do it in a way that produces the minimum amount of scrap and the minimum, minimum amount of rework. So it, anything other than that is, in my opinion, not, not a quality outcome. But quality to me always has to point back to a business outcome. It can't be an academic exercise for its own sake. Can we completely eliminate scrap, you think? Uh, can we make maybe spaceships or robots that never break? As long as people are involved in the production process, Mikhail, I, I would I would argue no. And anything that people build, I think, is going to have will have in, in, in inherent opportunities for failure and inherent opportunities for defects and flaws. But I do think as we go forward, we can you know, we can get that down to a six or or eight sigma level. I and mean, we've we've demonstrated that with air travel, right? That the likelihood of your luggage getting safely to your destination is much lower than the likelihood of you getting to your destination safely. So I think we've demonstrated on a large scale, and I, I use air travel as an example a lot in class, that where we can't, where you can deploy and get to a very low defect rate on a on a large scale. Um, and I think I think we can get to to a similar level of safety and defect free uh, operating environments within space travel. I think we're I, ultimately we're we're going to have to to make it viable. And make it make it accessible beyond just a very a very small group of, of select group of people who get to go. The perfect segue to my next question. You mentioned that as long as people are involved in these processes, um, we will not be able to eliminate scrap. What if there are no people involved? What if it's all about robots and automation and the smart factories of the future? Do you think it's possible in that way? I'll just say this: I don't know that it's ever going to be possible to completely reduce defects. I think you can. I think you can get the sigma level down to a point where defects are functionally non-existent, where the likelihood of a defect is so low as to be statistically non-existent. But I do think that's going to require, to your point, Mikhail, significant levels of of automation to get there. Because once again, I I love people. But anytime you introduce people, you introduce a significant variable into your process that is hard to control for. So I get it. Uh, in the future, what you're talking about is we not going to have any people. Everything will be done by robots, automated. Um, is we, that, is that we all, <laughs> and we all and we all sit around and enjoy the fruits of our of our automated labor. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Or or we end up with uh, with Terminator, right? Um, but uh, no, I don't. I don't know that. I, I don't know that I necessarily think that's going to be the case. What I do think, though, one of the tenets of Six Sigma, at, at least for me, is don't ask people to do things that people aren't fundamentally well suited to do, and that includes tedious, repetitive tasks. And ask them to do it at a very high level of, of accuracy. I think a lot of those tedious, repetitive tasks will be automated. I think a lot of those, a lot of industries still waiting for the uh, the automation of the 18 wheeler to come out and completely disrupt the uh, the trucking industry. It's coming and it'll get here. It'll get here and it will absolutely be a game changer in that space. But um, I think what, what you'll see, Mikhail, is specific industries will be, will I think, lend themselves better to automation than others. Manufacturing, obviously, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think transportation lends itself really well to automation. And but what I think what what I think you'll see is a shift from what the tasks and activities that people do from being more repetitive and, and tedious to being more creative and, and higher level problem solving. That to me is actually kind of exciting because I think that's what people are fundamentally well suited to do. You know, we it, it's hard to program a machine to come up with a very creative solution to something. It's a lot easier to program a machine to do a repetitive task error free or largely error free. So in our time horizon, we're thinking about 200 years, right? Do you think there's anything that cannot be automated? You mentioned creative tasks, right? So think about 200 years. You still think it's not going to be possible to automate? Um, this. You know, it's hard to forward, it's hard to project that, right? Because if you think about Moore's law in 200 years, what does that look like? 
when you talk about processing speed and, and you talk about computing capacity and stuff and you roll that forward exponentially over 200 years, number one, I don't think we'll all be zipping around like the Jetsons or, uh, or the, the guys in Blade Runner. But I do think life will look fundamentally different. I'd like to think that life will be a lot cleaner and greener than it is today. I think a good chunk of the work that we do today will be gone and will be largely replaced by some sort of automation. And so, you know, the thing about like the job I have today, the job I have today when I graduated from college didn't exist. So in a relatively short span of time, effectively a generation, I mean, I never would have envisioned myself doing this, in, you know, 25 years on. In another 25 years, I may be doing something completely different. And I think as we roll the clock forward, and you try to project forward over a span of 200 years. I think fundamentally, most of what we do today will not be done by humans. No, this makes sense. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Tom. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here. And I want to nudge your imagination. And it's going to touch a little bit on what you just spoke about. But we're going to go into a little more detail into imagining what our future world would look like in the technologies that you spoke about, automation, robotics, space travel. So Stephen Hawking said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. So if it's one thing that's constant, it's change in the, you know, in the next 50, 100, 200 years. So if we were to extrapolate the logical force of automation or robots or, you know, the technologies that you spoke about, what incremental change do you think will happen in the next 50 years, 100 years, or even in the next 200 years as the ultimate vision 2222? Will humanity survive, first of all? I, I, I tend to be, so let's, let's start with your first question. Will, will, will humanity survive? I'm going to paraphrase badly Winston Churchill in a, a comment he made about, about America. He said, I trust America or something to this effect. I trust America to do the right thing after it's, after it's tried everything else first. And I would extend that to humanity. I trust humanity to get to the right answer after we've tried everything else first. So I'm long-term optimistic on, on the future of humanity, barring some you know, catastrophic event we can't control, a meteor strike or something like that. But I am long-term optimistic on the future of humanity in general, because I, I've traveled pretty extensively around the world with jobs, and, I've, and there is a lot of untapped human resource and a lot of untapped creativity around the world, and in, in the developing world. And as that gets better access to technology, to education, to opportunities to elevate their station, that creativity is going to come online. And, and their, their experiences, their cultures, their backgrounds are going to bring a different perspective and a different lens to solving problems versus, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the traditional Western hemisphere centric approach to, to problem solving. And so I think that as those folks get more engaged and get more involved in their, their lot in life improves, they're going to start to, to bring a, a different a different creativity and a different spin to problem solving. So that's not going to happen tomorrow. That's going to be that's going to be incremental over time. So if if you ask me what 50 years from now looks like, I think one the developing world is going to have a much bigger say in what goes on. I, by the developing world, I'm talking I'm talking about Africa, I'm talking about I, I frankly China outside of outside of the cities, you know, the rural, rural Chinese, Central Asia. Latin America. We have operations in, in Latin America now, and there's a tremendous amount of, of untapped potential there. And that's a market that's fairly well that's fairly well on its way. So I think a, I think those parts of the world are going to have a much bigger say in how technology moves going forward, if for no other reason than I, frankly birth rates. Right? They're going to become they'll, they'll become much more important simply because there's going to be a lot more of them. The math says that that's going to be what where it will be. Um, I think we I, I would like to think that we can find better ways to move ourselves around. I think transportation is going to be one of the real areas where we see a lot of disruption and, tra- and transformation in, the, in those industries. Because you mentioned automation. Correct? I did. Yeah. And look, I, and to me, I'm super excited about, about autonomous vehicles as a way to reduce traffic, commute time, stress. I think there, I think that's got a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I, and I think in, I think in the Western world, as we understand it today, Roll the clock forward 50 years. I don't know that we're going to own cars. We may, you know, the, the concept of ride sharing has been pretty disruptive. And I think if you couple that with autonomous vehicles, I don't know that I need a car in that case. I may just pay for a, pay for rides as I need them and consume that service as I need it. 
Um, and frankly, I think it'll be a lot safer and the roads will be a lot less congested. The one thing autonomous vehicles don't do is stare at their phone and then figure out at the last possible second they're four lanes away from the exit that they're, they're about to fly by and cut in front of everyone to get over there. We've all dealt with that on the West Loop, I'm sure. And, and I mentioned, too, with, with over-the-road trucking, there's always going to be a need for that. But if you automate those trucks, effectively, you just double the size of your fleet without adding any vehicles to it. Because of regulations in the United States, truck, truckers can only drive a certain number of hours a day. Machine can drive 24-7. And that can have a big impact on the cost of goods, right? 100%. Absolutely. And it will disperse those goods and make them more, to your point, cost effective in rural areas. So you'll start to see a more equitable distribution of materials and, and access to goods and correspondingly lower prices, in my opinion. And as that technology becomes more available in what is today the developing world, they're going to accelerate pretty quickly as well. I, th I think dispersed and I also think dispersed power. You know, I was in Africa for work a few years ago, and you know, one of the big game changers there was a, an incandescent bulb with a, with a small solar cell on it. So it'll, it'll charge during the day, and now those folks in an otherwise unlit shack, well, now their kids can go to school and do homework at night because they have light. It's little things like that that over time will incrementally transform, and in 50 years, that you won't recognize that. The developing world will look very, very different than it does today. And uh, Tom, taking that thought a little further from 50 years to, say, 200 years horizon, right? So what's dear to my heart is digital supply chain. And thinking about the revolution we've all witnessed in the musical industry, we don't carry CDs with us anymore. We carry yeah. all and everything in just one device that you can access anywhere, anytime. So now, can we apply the same concept to, um, to goods, to physical goods? What if you can print anything, anytime, anywhere? Maybe oh, right. today it's not possible, but 200 years, I can see definitely that this could be a, could be a thing. No, the whole, that whole, the whole concept of the, uh, the Star Trek replicator, Mikhail. <laughs> right. Look, I don't know that it's that far-fetched. If you look at where 3D printing was even five years ago and what it's capable of today, to your point, I don't know that that's all that far out there. Now, it, there, there will be limitations to it. There will be physical physical limitations to it because you still do have to have the raw material to print, right? You've got to have access to some sort of print medium to print whatever you want. Now, you may be able to do it very quickly, but you're still going to have to have access to that print medium. And it may just be a case where I can go plug my device into a kiosk of some kind and plug it in, pay for it, and it prints whatever I'm looking for in a fairly short, short order. Right, right. I have it at home and I can do the same thing. Right. right. And now think about, uh, yeah, you mentioned raw material. Uh, it needs to be there, some sort of device. But think about it that way. If we can invent a nanofabricator, the building blocks of the universe are the same everywhere. You have elementary <laughs> particles and, uh, and mm -hmm. atoms. Now, what if you can just assemble them on demand to whatever shape and form and material you want? So I'm not as clever or creative as you are. And, and uh, I would say, uh, yeah, the, it, look, it would be fantastic. I would not be as bullish on that as being available in a hundred years. I think if that if we're going to get there, that feels to me more, like more of a two hundred year target. Yeah. Right, and, and that's what I'm thinking about. Really, yeah. we, right. we're trying to see way, way into the future. Something that we can't even possibly imagine today, but potentially in the future. That that's the whole purpose, I think, of these conversations is to get yeah. get us creative <laughs> think outside the box to your point because you think that there is definitely going to be in the next 50 years some sort of change in automation with transport and if we were to extend that to 200 years does it apply to space technology and you know humans being able to settle out of space uh, do you think that we would put that much interest into travel beyond planet earth I'd like to think that we would. I think just as naturally curious creatures, I think I do think we will at some point. We'll, we, it'll be interesting to see how we deal with acceleration at or near light speed. Mm. I'm not a physicist by any stretch, and, and uh, Mikhail will certainly correct me where I'm wrong with his. He's got a much better background at this than I do. But you know, we had, I, I think we we had the same issue when we when we were talking about the sound barrier, right? You know, what's yes. going to happen when we accelerate faster than the speed of sound and you, and you disengage the object from the sound that it makes? Is that same thing going to happen as we approach light speed or not? <laughs> or is that literally a, a physical barrier we 
we can't get around. But I think, it, I, but I do think, Amanda, we are going to move off of Earth at some point. Whether that's to the moon, first, I have a lot of friends who work at the Johnson Space Center. They're very excited about about what's happening with manned space flight um, right now. But, I, you know, I do think we will move to the moon and potentially beyond, I think, within my lifetime, candidly. I don't know that we'll colonize it, but I think we'll certainly, we're on our way back to the moon. But we will, I think we will visit beyond the moon in my lifetime, hopefully. Thank you so much for taking this imaginary trip into the future, you know, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. I just want to ask, do you think, you know, based on all the technologies that you talked about in, in your imagination, do you think we will ever get to a point where we can time travel as humans? Oh, boy, I'd like to think we could. Just as somebody who grew up enjoying science fiction, I'd really like to think that we could. I, but I, I yeah, I just don't know. And, I, and it may just be the limitations of my own imagination. I'd love to think that we'd figure out a way to do that. But even if we can't do that, I'd love to think that we could figure out a way to travel fast enough, even if we can't yes. manipulate time, to be able yes. to travel beyond the solar system and see what else is out there. That's right. re- endlessly fascinating to me. And that's the kind of stuff that in your quiet moments, when you're being a little bit reflective, you think about and boy, boy that'd be really cool. But I, I don't know about time, but I'd like to think we can travel fast enough to, to break out of the, the solar system. Oh, right. For now, we'll enjoy it in the movies <laughs> until yeah, we exactly. get there. Exactly. Well, great. And so we have a, a little question that we like to ask our guests on Vision 2222, and it's about time traveling. So if you had a chance for just one trip to go either forward in time or backward in time, what time period would you choose and why? Uh, this is an easy one, Amanda. I would go back to 1865 and I would go back to Ford's Theater and I would knock John Wilkes Booth over the head with a shovel. Because I think a lot of the problems in America, a lot of the, the, the issues we have and a lot of the tensions we have around race and class relations are due in large part to the fact that Lincoln was killed before he got a chance to implement his reconstruction plan of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And Mm -hmm. not to be serious, not to bring this to a serious place for a second, but if I could go back and change one thing in history um, as an American, that's the point I would pick. And nothing else in my experience as a historian with two degrees in history, in my opinion, comes close as a pivot point to how the United States has gone from that point. Wow. Interesting point. You really found something that I could jump on board with. uh, None of us can tell whether Lincoln would have succeeded, but he was in a better position to succeed than anyone else we've had in that position. He perfected the ability to bring enemies essentially into the same camp and make it work. His entire cabinet was composed of opponents. And in some people's mistaken understanding of the situation, they thought that Lincoln was the submissive player, when in fact, what he was, was a a master organizer. And that sort of talent does not often appear in the presidency. Plus, with his vision, the mistakes of Reconstruction and the fact that the North backed out way too early, that could definitely have been avoided. Looking back at the things we've covered, though, this has been a, a lot of fun to talk with you about what's possible now and begin to apply those kinds of concepts to the future. Taking the experience with automating transportation now and applying it in a long term, do you have some sort of idea how that might look as it rolls forward in just the next 25 years? I think we roll the clock forward 25 years, John. And by the way, thank you for the comments about Lincoln. I I think about that a lot. And it's particularly interesting, having been raised in the North and then living in Texas, for the last 25 years, the disparate perspectives on him as a, as a president. But we'll set that aside for a second and answer your second question. Yeah. If we roll the clock forward 25 years, and number one, I think within 10 or 15 years, we won't have over-the-road truck drivers anymore. That industry will be completely automated. And those mm-hmm. folks, if they're not out looking for job retraining now, they need to get after it. Because mm-hmm. my general sense is on that, it's going to go, it's going to hockey stick. It's going to go from little bit, little bit, little bit to gone. And it's away. And that, that industry as it exists today, is is gone in five to 10 years, in my opinion. I think autonomous vehicles for consumers are a little bit different, but I do think by, again, 20, 25 years from now, I don't think, 
I don't think we'll have nearly as many individually owned automobiles as we do today. I think most automobiles will be combination hybrid or, or electric. We do need to figure out how we're going to generate all the power to charge those things, but that's a, that's a different conversation. And once again, long-term bullish, I think we'll figure that out. Um, we do also need to figure out what we're going to do with the batteries on it, but that's, again, I'm long-term bullish on that. I think we'll figure that out. But I, I do think 25 years from now, there'll be far fewer cars on the road in the, the developed world, in the Western world, as we understand it. I mean, airplanes already largely fly themselves. The pilot's really only there in case something fails. I think that will, I think that industry, I think the over the road trucking industry, and very honestly, I think a lot of the maritime stuff will be automated. You know, mariners, aircraft pilots, and commercial truckers are all going to be by and large done within a generation. And I think a lot of us won't be driving. And, it's, I, and the same thing for a lot of, a lot of transportation. I think bus networks will be largely, train networks will be largely automated. Once again, people are, are in the seat now, I think more because there's a reluctance to, you know, they want somebody there in case something, in case the system fails. But as those systems get better and more robust and less likely to fail, the need for, for people to sit behind the wheel of a, of a train you know, obviates to, to effectively zero. It's an interesting thing because it is a huge cultural shift. The United States, we love our cars. We conflate them with our independence, our individuality. But I think that you're right. We're seeing cracks in that. We'll see how it plays out. But just in my children's generation, I saw such a huge difference from the time when I grew up. When I grew up, 16 years old, huge watershed event. You got your driver license. Right here. Yeah. My kids' generation, half their friends were saying essentially, uh, driver license. What, what do I need that for? That alone makes me think, oh, well, this cultural shift is possible. It's not an impossible barrier. You said another thing that to me stands out as one of the most important things that has come up in this conversation, and that is the untapped potential of the developing world. That is a notion that I think is very, very powerful. Think about the numbers of people and think about the understanding that I think we have now that human quality is equal. So human Training and education is not, but when you apply sufficient training and education to people, they do rise to the same level. So any kind of closing comments you might have about the ways that we can move forward and enable the populations who are currently underserved. I think you touched on something there that I'm going to use to as part of my closing comment, and that is the cultural biases around the developing world. I think there is still an undercurrent of bias that those folks are maybe just aren't as capable of as the Western developed world is. Hmm. Again, I think that's shifting, but I, and I think a lot of that is based in the fact that most folks haven't been there. Um, I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel there and see that, and that Creativity and intelligence are distributed equally, and given access, those people will come up with solutions to problems that we in the, in the current developed world would never envision, because we simply have a different worldview, cultural view, uh, upbringing, experience set, et cetera. And I think the more access we can provide to folks in the developing world, the better off we're all going to be long term. And I think that we need to be intentional and methodical about providing access to those folks and do everything we can to support their development and their, their acceleration as they move down the, the learning curve. In a sense, what you're saying, our survival as a human race depends in large part on our engaging the whole human race. I 100% agree with that. Look, as, as long as we've got 60% of the world that's large, largely living in poverty and at a subsistence level as humanity, we're not going to get very far. If that's still the case in 50 years, I think then we've, we've, we've failed. A powerful closing statement. One of the things we ask at the end of our conversations is, where can people find you if you, if you want to be found? Online or via other communication? Or what are some of the organizations or sources of information that you might like to suggest to our listeners so that they can start finding out for themselves some of the things that we've discussed today? You're more than welcome to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my LinkedIn profile is fairly straight ahead. I'm the only Tom, I think I'm the only Tom Lytle in Houston. So certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn. 
and, and visit our website, www.ranaanalytics.com. And you can connect with me there as well. I'm not, I'm just enough of an old bogey John to not be really active on Twitter and, and that kind of thing. Although we, we do some social media engagement for our company, but LinkedIn and the website are probably the best places for, for folks to connect with me. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this, this has been a pleasure having you here. And this conversation is, is really, really interesting, taking us into many different directions and different areas and help me better uh, imagine our future world and see the hurdles as well. Well, yes, thank, thank you all you. for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this and I've really enjoyed the, op- the opportunity and the freedom to be a little bit uh, a little bit creative and kind of allow my mind to, to drift and wander in, into places that it doesn't necessarily get to in, in the day-to-day. So thank you guys very much. Yes. For, for yes, thank you as well, Tom. You know, talking about the future always gives a little bit of excitement and curiosity and each of, you know, these conversations that we have is really enlightening just to hear what people people think so thank you so much for your thought appreciate it thank you for listening to this episode of vision 2222 and if you enjoyed what you heard please subscribe like and share with your friends please also comment and we'll do our best to respond